Hello. This has been on my heart for the last week, and I um, met Mr. Ortega um, several years ago. His daughter and her husband went to our congregation, and um, they kind of we were they're kind of my spiritual parents for a while until they had to move back to their home state, and. Her dad was an uh, American POW who was a slave of the Japanese during World War II for three and a half years. And um, Abba's been speaking to me about courage. Courage on baton and beyond. And I wanted to read some things of, and from his book that I, I just feel was really important. And his, his first name was Abel. Um, he has moved on, graduated and to um, heaven. Um, and the scriptures that I'm going to read, of course, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness. Righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And now, Psalm 91. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide in the shadow of the Mighty. I will say to the Lord that he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him I will trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noise and pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings shall you take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and receive and behold the reward of the wicked, because you have made the Lord which is our refuge, even the most higher habitation. Therefore, no, sh no evil shall befall thee, neither shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. They shall bear you up in their hands, lest you dash your foot against the stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the adder, and the young lion and the serp dragon or serpent, you shall trample underfoot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high, because he has known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him, and I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him, and I will honor him. With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Now, I'm going to go here to Hebrews chapter 11. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtain a good report. Through faith we understand the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which... He obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead, yet speaketh. This man, his name's Abel Ortega, and I'm going to read some of this book, and I, I, I hope it encourages to, you know, even in the depths of, of despair and the things that he went through, um, he never left God, nor did God ever leave him. So here's Miss Ortega. This is pictures taken after basic training in 1941. So that's Miss Ortega. And then the beginning. On August 22, 1919, 
Um, he was born to Reuben and Deborah Ortega, and he was the fifth child born into his family, but there was something very unusual, he says, about his birth. He says, before I was born, my, born, my mother spent days and nights crying, and she could not understand why. She had never cried like this with any of her other children. I'm sure that later in life, when I would become a prisoner of the Japanese, she might have understood why. So my mother gave me more than her share of love, so that I would become the fattest little baby of our family. Oh, I loved my mother very much and was always trying to do things around the house that would please her. My mother would always depend upon me when our, my other brothers didn't want to run errands. And I could hear my mother now. I'm not very good at my at the Spanish. I apologize. Ablito, por favor, anda la tienda por mí. Tus hermanos son unos flotes que no puedo hablares que vian a la tienda por me tu papa viene a comer muy pronto y no tengo nada que prepare. I think that's prepare. Translated in English. Abel, please come and run this errand for me to the store. Your brothers are a bunch of old lazy bones and I can't even get them to go to the store for me. Your daddy's coming home for lunch pretty soon and I haven't a thing ready for him. So he goes on, he talks about how there were six Ortega boys in World War II at the same time. Elicio and I were in the Pacific, Ruben was in Alaska, and Sam, Ben, and Daniel were in Europe. Daniel paid the ultimate sacrifice on the beaches of Normandy. So here's his family, Ortegas, Sam, Daniel, Abel, Ben, Ruben, Elicio, Deborah, and Martha. He had his basic training at Fort Knox, Kentucky, and his unit in basic training was the AFRTC 8th Battalion, Company B. Here's a picture of him with us in Fort Knox, Kentucky, and then he went to the 753rd GHQ Tank Battalion, Camp Polk, Louisiana, in 19. The 32nd Division National Guard tank in Janesville, Wisconsin, reported for duty as a 192nd Tank Battalion Company. It was made up of four companies. He goes in and talks about that. His trip to the Philippines. Soon after I joined the 192nd, we were given our secret orders to go to the Philippines. Our code name was Plum. It was supposed to be a secret, but everyone found out about it, even the locals. I guess that goes to show you how good our secret orders were kept secret. And so he talks about going there. And here is the National Archives, Archives USS AP 43 HL Scott. Now, we arrived in the Philippines on Thanksgiving Day, November 20th, 1941. And they were sent to their designated briefing areas where they got their orders. And um, we, they were told to tr help train Filipino Army in tank warfare and operations and then later go into China to help train their national nationalist army. See, their tank battalion was sent by train to Fort um, Stotzenberg from Manila. And then... So he goes through here and he talks about, see here, and then he talks about the bombs starting to fall and that he um, manned the 50 caliber machine guns and cocked the levers back and unloaded on those on the Japanese planes and so he goes through and he talks about that and then he pulled up the front lines and he talks about how emotions can get the best of you. His captain had been killed and as an infantry um, would retreat back, it was up to the tankers and half trucks to try to hold the enemy back. It was very chaotic up on the front lines. And He said, in this law and fighting we had was such a welcome break. You see, the Japanese had thought they could take the Philippines in a sh just a short time. They had been taught that the Americans were weak, 
while they had to use the law to resupply their troops from Singapore and other areas because we had ruined their plans to take the Philippines. What was supposed to be a one-month battle turned out to be a five-month battle from December 8, 1941 to April 9, 1942. Not to take anything away from Pearl Harbor, but they were bombed in one day. We were bombed for five months. General MacArthur sent a message telling us that help and supplies were on the way, but that never happened. It got our mor morale up a little, but deep down inside, I knew it wasn't going to happen. By the time March 1942 came around, we were already on a thousand calories a day meal. That is not enough to sustain a fighting soldier, especially those that are suffering from tropical diseases and malnutrition. And some of the diseases that they had were malaria, dengue fever, and diarrhea. All their supplies were cut off. And we had no way of getting food, medicine, and ammunition to continue the fight. Now, you know, <clears throat> for genteel ears, I apologize, but this is what they were. Um, they were known as the Battling Bastards of Bataan. We're the Battling Bastards of Bataan. No mama, no papa, no Uncle Sam, no aunts, no uncles, no cousins, no nieces, no pills, no planes, no all at all at artillery pieces, and nobody gives a damn. So that's what they were up against. And then... <clears throat> They had been, they had been starving to death. We had eaten all the cavalry mules and horses, all the native caribou, he said, and whatever else moved in the jungles. There were plenty of pythons to eat along with lizards and monkeys. One time, one of the guys saw a monkey in a tree and we decided to eat it. He shot the monkey and skinned it, but afterwards he held it up and looked. It looked just like a little human baby. So he just threw it away. Another thing we learned was whatever the natives would eat, we would do the same thing. When you're starving, you learn to adapt and overcome thoughts of what you're about to eat. You know, here this, again, this soldier, I mean, how in the midst of war and starvation couldn't do, you know, something with that monkey because it looked like a child. And here we have people in the United States sacrificing their babies to Moloch an abortion and they think that they know everything and that it's just it it's just unbelievable to me you know and here this soldier couldn't do that we are getting ready to make our last stand on baton in march 1942 uh, general douglas macarthur was ordered by president roosevelt to leave for australia he sent a message for all those on baton to fight to the last man and give command over lieutenant general jonathan wainwright that was such a hard blow to us considering he had been on the island fortress of the Corregidor, safe from all the bombings and supplied with food and medicine that we could have used. So he goes in here and they wanted to, so they had told him to surrender. And the reason why is he wanted to, um, I guess, let the guys have a chance to survive. He did this at the hope that we would survive and be treated according to the laws of the Geneva Convention. We came to find out that Japan didn't sign the Geneva Convention and had no regard for humanity. We soon found out the true meaning of brutality. The Japanese did not care whether we lived or died. And this was the surrender. He goes and he talks about, he goes and destroys some of the um, equipment and this is what happened to him. And he said, I, he smashed the dashboard, the engine, the gun, and the rear tracks. After I did that, I fell to the ground on my knees and cried and cried, cried like a baby. After I had finished crying, I looked up to the sky through the trees and I said these words, Oh God, I don't want to die. I'm too young to die. But if it's your will, Lord, I'm ready. But please, Lord, Please don't let me die. If you let me live, I'll do all I can to help my fellow prisoners and whatever may lay ahead. After I'd finished talking with God, I cried some more. Just think, I was 22 years old and 8,000 miles away from home. After lying there on the ground for some time, I dried the tears with my sleeves and my shirt and stood up determined to face whatever may lie ahead. One of the thoughts that ran through my mind was to run into the jungles and hide and not permit myself to be captured. 
I started to do that, but I had come back because I remembered the promise I had made to God. At last, I would get to see the enemy, the Japanese. They looked as bad as we did, with dirty uniforms, long mustaches, and straggly beards. We marched to a town called, I'm sorry, I don't understand, Marvellis, which was on the Bataan Peninsula. And so they went through that and they started, and that's when the surrender started in the, in the march. And the Bataan Death March, um, they walked 65 miles to San Fernando and rode a hell train boxcar for 24 miles to Capas. We then had to march another seven miles to Camp Odana, Camp Odana, Donal. In the minds of the Japanese, if you were surrendered, you were not worthy to live. You were lower than the dogs to them. So that's how we were treated. It's been estimated that approximately 78,000 Americans, Filipinos, and civilians started this march with about 60,000 to 65,000 surviving and reaching the first camp. The Japanese had underestimated the enormous amount of people and they were not prepared for this. We were starved, sick, and had, sick and had been fed on less than a thousand calories a day rations. We were not capable of making this march and it was evident by the number of dead that were on the sides of the road in the ditches. Some were bayoneted, decapitated, shot, and run over by the Japanese trucks. There's some pictures. They were ordered off the truck and then he talks about the brutality. There were a couple of guys who had the gold fillings and there were a couple of guys who had their teeth knocked out because of that. As a Christian boy growing up, this was very hard to deal with. The situation was very chaotic because the guards were yelling at us in Japanese and of course they didn't know what what it, you know what they were saying. More pictures of that. Um I goes on to talk about this. He was not used to the brutality and terror. And then he hadn't eaten for several days. His canteen was getting low. And he talks about men had, that had given up. They had no desire to live anymore and didn't care what happened to them. Once you gave up and you were, you were dead, I didn't want to give up. I had a strong will to survive and my faith in God kept me alive. I was not about to let the Japanese get the best of me. We had come to our first stop on the road when I noticed that some of the prisoners were looking at me and yelling and cursing obscenities for no reason at all. They were blaming me for their agony and the predicament that we were in. They had thought that I was Filipino and they were really getting hostile towards me. I really felt sad and deeply hurt that my fellow soldiers were treating me this way. I tried to defend myself by telling them that I was an American from Texas. But with all their hollering and shouts, they didn't hear a word I said. But I was also faced with having to deal with hostile American prisoners taking this situation out on me. And so he talked about a man that st stood up to him and that he was a true American because he'd been here longer than most of them had. So... And the brutality kept getting worse. You can get this, you know, I can give you the, um, the ESPN or ISPN number to do this, to get this book. And so he talks about, I had very little water or food for the entire march of seven days and 96 miles. On the fifth, sixth, and seventh days, I had a spoonful of rice. One time I came across some candy of some sort, and I don't even remember how I got it. I would imagine a Filipino threw it at us as we walked by and caught it, and I put it in my pocket to snack on. And so he goes through and he finds one of his uh, buddies from his in uh, his town, and his name was uh, George Seaman, and he was our catch catcher. His daddy owned a shoe repair shop on Red River Street which was just around the corner from where we lived. He was an Arab, which, which explains the heavy beard growth. That's how you recognized him. Just think of all the guys on the march. I happened to be behind our old catcher from Austin, Texas, George Eugene, and I became real close buddies on this march, and we looked out for each other. And George was a medic, and he had some of these uh, sulfo, 
Zoli tablets because he had dysentery and he gave him some of it and it cured him. And then rank didn't matter. Nobody, it didn't matter for anything because they were, they were determined to, you know, everybody was the same on this. And he talks about Camp O'Donnell and he talks about how they talked about him, how they were cowards. And you should have, you should have just committed a suicide. And then he goes from camp to camp. And again, there was no G Geneva Convention on this. So they didn't sign that. There's an old saying that dying is easy, living is hell. That is true. I p was put on burial detail shortly after I got to camp. Approximately 16,000 died in the first two months of this camp. We would bury around 100 guys a day. That was one of the most somber jobs I had as a POW. The smell of death was in the air, and it was horrible. He goes and goes through and talks about it, and this is another camp that he went to. Here is a POW card, and his number was 8247. Um... He said that we would eat together, stayed in the same hut, and just tried to do everything together we could. Having someone, he had another person he met from his hometown. It was horrible to see these guys this way, but there was nothing we could do. Those prisoners were so far gone, gone they could not think clearly. They would try to walk out of camp or walk right into the fence, and it was our job to make sure no one escaped. The Japanese would put the prisoners in ten-man groups. And if one of the prisoners escaped, they would shoot and kill the other nine. As always, there were guards in the building with us and in the towers to make sure we didn't slip away ourselves. And he said oh, he, bur he buried a lot of fine soldiers, American soldiers there at Camp O'Donnell. And the next day, it would start all over again. He said, those were sad days all right. So anything that they could do to try to survive and stay alive, they did. Since we did, he said, since we did not have any actual coffee, we would burn the rice black and then boil it in water. The water would come out black, and that was our coffee. It was not as good as the mountain-grown coffee, but that's all we had. And here is his camp. I don't know how to pronounce that. I'm sorry. Um, he goes to another camp, so he's very he's moved around quite a bit, and so. And that's Mr. Ortega, and when I met him, of course, that's me. <laughs> Maybe I'll show a picture of myself later, I don't know. And if you hang around through this video. And Camp Murphy, here's another camp. And so here is this, so um, not all the Japanese guards were bad, but this one was really mentally unstable, and the camp commander let him harass us any way he could. He was never satisfied with any shape of any rock or how we would put it down. So they did hard manual labor. And then, so what would happen is he would go from one prison to another, hitting us and never making any sense. It was pure harassment, and it made our days go by slowly. We had to have good control over ourselves in situations like this. There were many times the thought ran through my mind to pick up a rock and just hit him over the head and do away with him. But I had to get rid of those thoughts if I were to survive. What does it say? Gird up the loins of your mind. So, you know, he wanted to do that, but he, he knew that would lead to disaster. And so he did. He, he stopped thinking those kind of thoughts because he just wanted to survive. And he goes and talks about hell ship. And the term hell ship has been used to refer to the ships the Japanese used to move POWs to various camps during World War II. Contrary to the provisions of the Geneva Convention, these ships were not marked in any way to show that they were transporting POWs. Many were targeted by the U.S. Submarines and aircraft and Japanese um, attacked with great loss of life to the POWs held by the Japanese. And they were notorious for the completely inhuman way that prisoners were crowded into cargo holds with no ventilation and only minute amounts of water and food. Seems like this has happened a lot in history. 
lots of different people. Here's another camp. Oh, this is another, I'm sorry, another hell ship. And then he talks about what was interesting because the, the one was a, a place for coal dust. And he said there was lots of smells and there was no way for anybody to go. Um, you know, they would just, their bowels would have to go where they were at. One good thing about coal dust is that it has, one good thing about coal dust is that it helps absorb the excrement and men were ill within, with malaria, diarrhea, dysentery, and beriberi. Sorry, something's really wrong with my computer right now. Okay, beriberi. And that's what caused a lot of them to go out of their minds. They would be screaming from one side of the hole to the other. Some would be kicking those men around them, making it a living hell in the overcrowded conditions. But when they had the, the coal dust, what was, it, what was interesting is because they said that um, you couldn't recognize each other. Everybody looked the same. They were all, they all had coal dust. <laughs> and uh, so he was trying to find, I guess, some, some, he said, the overcrowded conditions, the heat, the stink, the thirst, the hunger, the misery, and the screams of the men going out of their minds cannot be described with true understanding. Words alone cannot describe the horror of this journey. But I let me tell you how I believe my mother's prayers helped me through this journey. She spent many a night on her knees praying for her son's safety. Before I boarded Hell Ship, I was walking to get on, and I noticed, and I noticed on the edge of the dock a small can a POW had made. I heard a voice say, pick it up. I looked again, but no one was talking to me. I heard it again, pick it up. So I picked up the can and I got on board. After I was shoved into the forward cargo hold, I landed where a funnel and brought some air right above me. When it rained outside or condensation dripped, I would use this can to catch the water and trade it for extra rice when I could. That just goes to show you how the power of prayer can work for you in times of need. I know now it was God who told me to pick that can up. Sometimes the mind tries to find a little humor in all bad situations as a coping mechanism. Since it was covered in dust, which made for a dusty situation, it didn't matter what color you were going in, you were coming out, you, you were the same coming out. One guy would turn to another and say, you look like me. Another would do the same, and then another, and before you knew it, we were all laughing because Anglos and Mexicans all looked alike. There was no difference, and to some of us, that was funny. He goes to yet another camp, and here are some of the sh um, ships. There's pictures of that, of the cargo ships that they were in. So here's another one of a Tokyo Harbor. And here's another camp. And he goes and talks about that. And he goes, for three years I had been starving, so he got to actually do a detail where I had food. And uh, he was late for camp one time, and he got beat for that. And so there was a lot of beatings and stuff that happened. And then his, this camp was the last camp that he arrived in where he would be stationed. And this was in May 21st, 1945. So he goes through that. And then by August 15th, all the guards were gone, and we had control of the camp. He talks about the reason why that happened. What happened was, he was looking at this. A few days later, I was sitting outside the yard of the camp. I was looking up at the clouds because as an artist, which he did, he, he and I didn't read that part, but he would carve different things on like cups and things for the um, soldiers in exchange for food. And he said, I was looking up at the clouds because as an artist, you tend to study their different shapes and colors. But on this day, the clouds are very unusual. This particular cloud I was looking at 
was very tall and it was rolling in and out of itself as if it were tumbling. It had a real pretty pinkish color, with blue sky background to it. I told the Japanese guard, there, look how pretty that cloud is. He had a real sad face and just turned around without looking at it. And he said this was the most beautiful cloud he had ever seen. And we know what that was. But see, he didn't understand because he, he was been in POW for three and a half years. And then that's when the Japanese surrendered. So, they talk about the Navy guys. Um, they were able to get the signals out and they were able to drop food and stuff. And then talked about what happened in this trip home from, uh, to go to California. He was deloused. He had a lot of, lot of, lot of things going, you know, physically. And um, he was able to get home. And he talked and saw his mama. He told him, your son, Abelito, is here. And I saw mama walking toward the door. She was wiping her hands on her apron. And that was the most beautiful sight I'd seen in my life. I cried and hugged my mama for a long time. It was my mama's prayers that kept me alive all those years. So I wanted to read that. And what really struck me, especially one of the things is talking about that cloud. And uh, there is a dream. I'll, I'll link this talking about, and this would be his son that helped him write the book before he went on to and moved, graduated to heaven. So I'll link that 